They ruled the oceans before dinosaurs walked the earth. Survivors of countless extinction events, sharks are perfectly designed predators. Their sleek bodies and razor-sharp teeth inspire awe and terror. But behind the sensational headlines and movie monster cliches lies a complex and awe-inspiring creature. Get ready to dive deep into the world of shark attacks as we explore true stories of survival and the science behind these encounters. Wharton Beach was a gash on the otherwise pristine coastline of Western Australia. A handful of shacks clung to the dunes, weathering the relentless ocean spray. This was a place for those with salt in their blood, not for the faint of heart. Kester Byrne was one of them. He worked the fish market, the stink of the sea embedded in his clothes and calloused hands. But it wasn't enough. He craved the open water, the dance with the waves, the taste of freedom on his lips. Great whites were a constant, unspoken presence here. Locals didn't speak their name often, just wary glances towards the dark depths where monstrous shadows lurked. Fishermen whispered stories, but Kester ignored them. He wasn't afraid. He was alive out there on his board. August 17, 2001 was stifling. The sun beat down, turning the market into an oven. Each fish sold, each crate hauled, was another step closer to the evening, to the water. His surfboard waited on the roof of his battered truck, a beacon promising release. The full moon rose, a fat pearl in the inky sky. Its light painted the sea in an eerie glow. The usual crowd was gone from Wharton. Something was wrong. A tension in the air, a ripple of unease. Kester felt it too, but dismissed it as the moon playing tricks. He paddled out, the only speck against the star-speckled expanse. The water felt alive beneath his board breathing with an exhilarating and chilling power. With every stroke, he went further, lured by the promise of the perfect wave. Beneath the surface, ancient instincts stirred. The great white sensed movement, a flicker of disruption in its otherwise tranquil world. It wasn't hunger that drove it, but an innate need to patrol, to test the boundaries of its kingdom. This new silhouette against the moonlit sky was a challenge, an intrusion. Kester was oblivious. He waxed his board, focused on nothing but the next big ride. The ocean, usually a raucous playground, now lay eerily still. He was poised, ready, unaware that the predator's eye was fixed on him, calculating. Tonight, Wharton Beach wasn't just his escape, but a hunting ground. The attack wasn't an explosion of water and teeth, but a silent, monstrous force from below. One second, Kester balanced on his board, poised for glory. The next, the world turned upside down. The Great White breached beneath him, an eruption of muscle and primal rage. Its massive jaws, lined with serrated teeth, chomped down not on his body but his board. The fiberglass shattered like brittle bones, flinging him into the air. Kester's scream echoed in the night, a raw cry of terror against nature's indifferent power. He hit the water hard, disoriented and gasping. The shark circled its dark form, a phantom in the churning foam. Each circle tightened, drawing an invisible noose. Kester's survival instincts flared. He kicked and thrashed like a desperate animal fighting for life. His hand found a chunk of board, and he gripped it like a lifeline. The shark lunged again, this time aiming for flesh. Kester swung the board wildly, a feeble shield. The beast bit down, the impact ripping the wood from his grasp and tearing into his leg. Pain seared him, white hot, followed by a sickening numbness. Blood swirled through the water, turning the moon's silver glow into a macabre crimson. The shark was methodical now, tasting, testing. Kester was prey, and it was time to finish the kill. The ocean roared in his ears, each wave a potential tomb. He could see the shore, tantalizingly close yet impossibly far. Another pass, another wound. His ragged screams turned into choked gurgles as salt water burned his lungs. On the beach, the time seemed to warp. One moment, the fishermen were just silhouettes etched against the moon. The next, a horrifying tableau unfolded before them. There were shouts and the frantic splash of a boat being launched. Chaos amidst the eerie calm of the moonlit night. Back in the water, Kester was fading. The shore was a blur, but he clung to its image, to the thought of life beyond the swirling red. Each ragged breath was a victory, however small. Then a glimmer of hope. The boat, a speck gaining ground in the foam. Shouts reached him, rough voices urging him on. The shark sensed the shift in the hunt. It circled warily, unsure of this new intrusion into its domain. 
Kester felt his grip on consciousness weakens. His shredded leg throbbed with pain unlike any he'd ever known, his muscles spasming from the trauma. Then strong hands grasped him, hauling him over the boat's gunwale. The rough wood scraped against his wounds, sending another jolt of agony through his shattered body. Each scrape felt like fire burning through his open flesh. The boat sped back to shore, a wake of blood trailing behind. Someone pressed filthy rags onto his mangled leg, a desperate attempt to stem the flow. The pressure wasn't enough. Blood seeped through the makeshift bandage, hot and sticky. He could hear prayers, curses, and the relentless beat of his damaged heart pounding against a ribcage that felt ready to break. His vision tunneled, the world dimming. His body was shutting down. The cold crept in, a numbing wave that swept away the searing pain. He could see gashes down to the bone, mangled flesh where his calf muscle should be. A dark dread settled over him. Would he lose the leg or worse, his life? Then, blessedly, nothing. He slipped into a merciful darkness, the ocean's roar fading into a hollow echo. Kester Byrne had cheated death, but only barely. The aftermath would be long and brutal. Scars would mark his body, both seen and unseen. He would walk the land forever changed, marked by the night the Great White came for him under the hunter's moon. The mangrove forests of the Solomon Islands hummed with life. Salt water mingled with the scent of decaying leaves, a spicy perfume that clung to the humid air. This tangled web of roots and brackish channels was a cradle for the ocean's most feared predators, bull sharks. Known for their aggression and ability to tolerate fresh water, they ruled these murky waters. Dr. Anya Petrova was in her element. The dingy research boat barely contained her energy as she scanned the shallows. Years of dedication had led her to this place, this opportunity to study bull sharks in their most vulnerable yet crucial stage infancy. Today, May 23, 2003, was the culmination of countless grant proposals, sleepless nights pouring over data, and the endless battle against the skepticism that shadowed female scientists like herself. Their goal was simple in theory, dangerous in practice, tag juvenile sharks to track their growth and movement patterns. This data was vital. Bull sharks were increasingly threatened but understanding their nursery habitats was critical to any conservation effort. Anya's heart pounded with excitement and apprehension as they spotted the first pup, a sleek shadow barely two feet long. She donned her gear, a sense of purpose overriding any lingering fear. These sharks were not the mindless monsters of movies. They were creatures to be respected and their behavior was a complex code Anya was determined to decipher. The team carefully corralled, tagged, and released several pups. Each was a tiny victory, a data point in the fight to protect this misunderstood species. The sun beat down, turning the shallows into a shimmering soup. Even under the relentless heat, Anya couldn't tear herself away. The water here was a maze of channels, the mangrove roots like gnarled fingers obscuring anything below the surface. Anya was focused on a wriggling pup, oblivious to the subtle shift in the underwater world. Bull sharks were fiercely protective mothers. They lurked near their nurseries, unseen guardians against any potential threat. Food was secondary to this maternal instinct. Anya had dedicated her life to understanding sharks and dispelling the fear that surrounded them. She knew the risks, the calculated gamble of entering their domain. Yet she couldn't prepare for the speed, the raw power that would forever change her life. The mother shark didn't announce itself. There was no telltale fin cutting the surface, no ominous darkening of the water. Anya knelt in the shallows, focused on maneuvering the wriggling pup into the net. Her world smelled mud, the darting fish scattering from her movements, the squawk of a startled heron. Then a shift, not in the water but within herself. A primal, instinctive unease settled into her bones. It was a feeling she'd learned to trust over years of fieldwork an internal alarm bell signaling unseen danger. She lifted her gaze, scanning the surroundings. The mangrove roots loomed, creating deceptive pockets of shadow in the murky water. Has she had something move there? A flicker just beyond her reach of vision? The attack was a blur of pain and chaos. One moment she was searching. The next, a massive form exploded from the murky depths beneath her. The mother shark, twice the size of Anya herself, struck with blinding speed. Its jaws clamped down on her thigh, the serrated teeth tearing through flesh and muscle. 
Anya squirmed, more from shock than agony. Adrenaline surged, giving her a burst of unnatural strength. She thrashed, trying to break free, but the shark held with crushing power. Her vision blurred, the world tilting as the shark dragged her deeper into the mangrove maze. Her team was shouting, a panicked chorus above the thrashing water. Someone sprinted for the boat, the engine a desperate roar as they scrambled to reach her. Anya felt a sickening wave of nausea. Was this how it would end, not in a sterile lab but in this ancient cradle of predators? A surge of defiance flared brighter than fear. She wouldn't go down without a fight. With her free hand, she fumbled for her tagging knife, the small blade a pathetic defense. Gasping for air, she plunged it towards the shark's massive eye. It was a desperate, instinctual move. The shark reacted with a violent jerk, releasing Anya in a spray of blood and seawater. Momentarily disoriented, it thrashed blindly, giving her precious seconds. She swam with ragged strokes, clawing towards the boat now frantically churning towards her. Strong hands reached out, hauling her over the side as teeth snapped at empty air. Aboard the boat, the world dissolved into a red haze. Someone was applying frantic pressure to her mangled leg, their voice a distant echo against the roaring in her ears. The mangrove roots blurred as the boat sped away, leaving a crimson trail in their wake. Anya fought against the encroaching darkness, her scientist mind clinging to a single desperate thought. They had to get back and warn others. The field research station was a blur of activity. Rough hands cut away her wetsuit, exposing the gruesome wound. A tourniquet bit into her flesh, the world narrowing to a single screaming point of pain. She drifted in and out of consciousness, snippets of voices reaching her, radio calls, the thrum of a helicopter's approaching blades. When she awoke again, the sterile white of a hospital room momentarily disoriented her. Her leg throbbed relentlessly, a monstrous weight beneath the sheets. Anya was alive, but a part of her remained in that murky water, forever changed. News of the attack rippled through the conservation community. Shock, sympathy, and a hint of that old, familiar fear. The fear that fueled sensational headlines and hampered accurate understanding of sharks. Anya used that fear as fuel. She gave interviews from her hospital bed, her voice weak but with a newfound intensity. The story wasn't just about her. It was about the bull sharks, their vulnerability despite their power, and the delicate balance in those hidden mangrove nurseries. Her recovery was long and brutal. Physical therapy, phantom pains, the lingering trauma of the attack. Yet Anya emerged stronger, her mission unyielding. The bull sharks of the Solomon Islands had given her a voice, which she would use to fight for them, to change the narrative from fear to fascination, from monster to marvel. The white sand beaches and turquoise waters of Bora Bora shimmered like a dream, a postcard paradise plucked from an artist's imagination. It was the perfect backdrop for the beginning of Noah and Elise Fournier's new life together. Fresh from a whirlwind wedding celebration in their bustling hometown of Seattle, They'd escaped to this South Pacific oasis for the honeymoon of their dreams. Noah, with his tall, athletic build and an easy smile that crinkled at the corners of his deep blue eyes, was a man born for the sea. A competitive swimmer in college, he now had a high-stress investment banking job. The ocean was his sanctuary, the place where he felt most alive. Elise was his perfect counterpoint, a petite whirlwind of energy with her infectious laugh and bright green eyes. An aspiring writer, she approached the world with wide-eyed curiosity, her adventurous spirit tempered by a touch of trepidation when it came to open water. This morning, June 12, 2006, held a promise of adventure as they excitedly donned their snorkeling gear. The lagoon beckoned, a shimmering expanse of clear water promising vibrant coral gardens and glimpses of tropical fish. Still mastering her strokes, Elise stayed closer to shore while Noah ventured further out with the effortless grace of a natural swimmer. He'd wave occasionally, his muscular form disappearing into the deeper blues where the reef sloped away, a comforting presence even amidst her slight unease. Bull sharks were a known part of the local ecosystem. Their blunt snouts and powerful bodies sometimes spotted patrolling deeper waters. However, in these shallow, crystal-clear lagoons, they were a rare sight. Predators by nature were adaptable and followed the food sources, sometimes leading them into unexpected territories. And occasionally they made mistakes. The first hours were idyllic, 
Elise squealed in delight at spotting a clownfish nestled in an anemone, her fear of the deep fading with each discovery. With Noah as her anchor, she grew bolder, venturing further out. The water was a warm embrace, the mask offering a portal into a breathtaking world of iridescent fish darting among coral formations painted in colors she'd never imagined. Lost in her wonder, she didn't notice the subtle shift in the water beneath her, a shadow sliding along the reef's edge. The bull shark was young and inexperienced, and its hunting instincts were triggered by the splashing movements and the flash of Elise's pale skin. Hunger mixed with a surge of predatory curiosity overrode caution. Yet even the shark was unprepared for what followed. The explosion of adrenaline it received and the taste of neoprene instead of flesh as its jaws closed around Elise's leg. For Elise, the world tilted. The water around her turned an impossible red pain lancing through her. Panic flooded her, a primal scream trapped beneath the water's surface as the shark thrashed, confused and disoriented. Then a substantial force clamped around her arm and she was being pulled, the pressure on her leg excruciating. Noah had seen the change in the water, the flicker of shadow. His heart turned to ice. He knew that form instantly. Elise was oblivious, too far away, too focused on the wonders beneath her. He swam with every ounce of strength, his mind a single, desperate command, reach her. Realizing its mistake, the shark released Elise but thrashed nearby a dangerous, wounded presence. Noah reached her, his voice a harsh shout over the roar of his blood in his ears. He shouted to Elise to grab on him with urgency. Elise gripped his shoulders, her eyes wide with terror. Blood swirled around them, attracting more danger with each passing second. Working together, they half swam, half dragged themselves towards the pale blur of the shore. Each stroke was agony for Elise, the wave slapping her raw wound. Noah's strength was faltering. The shore was tantalizingly close but seemed to drift further with every kick. The water churned beside them, a chilling reminder of the predator lurking just out of sight. Then something miraculous, voices yelling the splash of a boat. Local fishermen, drawn by the commotion, were reaching for them. Elise's trembling subsided on the rough wood of the boat, replaced by waves of nausea and the growing numbness in her leg. Noah refused to leave her side, whispering words of love and fierce promises that she would live. The shore blurred and the pain dimmed. She slipped in and out of consciousness, the world reduced to his voice and the steady slap of waves against the boat. Recovery was an ordeal. Surgeries, the phantom pain, and the nightmares that stole what little sleep she got. Noah was her unwavering rock, putting his life on hold to care for her. Back home, away from the turquoise paradise, he became her advocate. They channeled the trauma, campaigning for stricter safety protocols in tourist locations and for funding research. That could help prevent such attacks. Their marriage was forged not only in love, but in the shared trauma of the lagoon. The scars on Elise's leg were a constant reminder, but so was the knowledge that they'd face the unimaginable and survived. The bull shark had almost stolen their future, but it had given them a shared purpose. Their honeymoon became a catalyst, their ordeal a testament to resilience and their voices a force for change in the fragile balance between humans and the wild world of the sea. The Western Australian coast wasn't a place for the faint of heart. The ocean was a force of nature, carving the land with relentless fury. Wind-blasted cliffs stared down at sea the color of churned steel, and below those deceptively beautiful waters lurked predators older than time itself. Elias Thorne loved it with a fierce, possessive passion. Salt was in his blood, the creak of old timbers more comforting than any song on land. His weathered face, etched with a lifetime of squinting into the sun, held a quiet contentment rarely found ashore. Fishing wasn't just his livelihood, it was his sanctuary. He knew these waters like others know their backyards, and understood the shifting moods of the sea and the creatures lurking within. Today, August 7th, 2002, something was off. The usual dawn chorus of gulls screeching and vying for scraps was absent. The air hung heavy, the tang of salt replaced by an almost metallic scent that pricked at the back of his throat. His boat, the weathered sea hag, felt sluggish, fighting the invisible hand of an unnatural current. Elias cursed under his breath. His instincts, usually as reliable as the tides, screamed at him to turn back. But a lifetime at sea, he had also taught him that fear was a dangerous companion. 
He'd ridden out storms that turned the stomachs of younger men, outwitted the tax collectors who patrolled the docks, and faced down loneliness that could swallow a person whole. He wasn't about to let a vague sense of unease chase him back to shore. He forced himself to focus, the familiar rituals of preparing his lines a soothing balm. Each knot was tied carefully. Each hook was checked and rechecked. The open ocean was an unforgiving mistress. The slightest lapse could mean disaster. Yet even as he went through the motions, that gnawing sense of wrongness clung to him like a stubborn fish scale. The sun climbed higher, turning the water into a molten mirror. Sweat trickled down his neck, the relentless glare making his eyes throb. Usually he relished this battle against the elements, but today it felt less like a challenge and more like a warning whispered by the endless empty sea. The first bite could have been a cleaner catch. His line went slack, then jerked violently, tremoring his arm. A surge of hope flared within him, finally a sign of life in this strange, desolate patch of ocean. He braced himself, reeling in the unseen beast with practiced strength. Then the monstrous form breached the surface and Elias's blood ran cold. It was a tiger shark, easily the biggest he'd ever seen. The creature was pure power, its eyes black and unyielding. This wasn't a curious bystander, but an apex predator claiming its territory. Elias was a man who could have been more easily spooked. He'd faced rogue waves, sudden storms, and even the occasional run-in with pirates desperate to target a lone fisherman. But this was different. The shark circled his boat, its movements a disturbing mix of deliberate focus and simmering rage. The sea hag, always a source of defiant pride, now felt like a flimsy eggshell against the might of this prehistoric monster. His mind raced. He knew appeasement was pointless. This shark wasn't after a free meal, it sensed a rival. If he stayed passive, he'd become the prey. Adrenaline spiked his blood, a primal echo of his place in the food chain. He wouldn't go down without a fight. Elias began to move, not with panic, but with strategic intent. His hands fumbled for a flare gun, but he knew its fiery warning wouldn't deter the shark for long. He scanned the deck. Gaff hook? Too short. Oars? It's useless against those jaws. Then his gaze fell upon his fishing rods, their tips gleaming in the sunlight. It was desperate and reckless, but something clicked in his fisherman's brain in that desperate moment. Elias unhooked the rod, snapping off the line. The metal tip glinted dangerously. Hefting it like a spear, he moved to the boat's edge. The shark surged, a dark wave rushing towards him. Elias bellowed a wordless battle cry to steady his nerves more than frighten the beast. He lunged, the metal rod plunging towards the shark's massive eye. It was a glancing blow, but it drew blood in a furious thrash. For a heart-stopping moment, the shark retreated, its wounded eye clouding the water with an eerie crimson swirl. Elias didn't have time to celebrate his small victory. The predator wouldn't give up so easily. Elias knew the shark's retreat was temporary. Wounded and enraged, it would regroup and strategize. He had mere seconds to act. The sea hag was taking on water, the shark's earlier nudges having done more damage than he initially realized. Time wasn't on his side. Frantically, he lashed his remaining gear to anything that would float empty fuel cans, a battered cooler, his life vest. The makeshift raft was pitifully crude, but it was his only hope. He worked with the desperate focus of a man fighting for his life his fisherman's mind clinging to the tiniest thread of possibility. The shark returned, its assault on the boat more frenzied. Wood splintered and cracked, the vessel listing dangerously. Now soaked and breathing hard, Elias knew his time had run out. With a final defiant bellow, he leaped from the sinking sea hag, landing awkwardly on his lashed-together raft. He watched his beloved boat disappear beneath the waves, the monstrous form of the shark circling the wreckage like a grim victor. Adrift on the vast ocean, his situation hit him with crushing force. He was utterly alone. Fear gnawed at his resolve, a far more dangerous foe than any shark. But underneath, a stubborn flicker of determination refused to die. He knew the drill, signal flares gone, ration the meager bits of water and food he'd salvaged. And then, a miracle, a far ship. He screamed until his voice cracked, waving his tattered shirt like a madman. The ship changed course, a lumbering savior against the endless blue. When they hauled him aboard, he was barely conscious. Elias survived, but some of him remained adrift in those lonely waters. The scars on his weathered skin were a badge of honor, a grim testament to the ocean's power. 
He never returned to the open sea, the place that had both sustained and nearly taken his life. The coast of Mozambique was known for its pristine beaches and vibrant coral reefs. Yet beneath the turquoise surface lurked a world of forgotten wonders. Dr. Maya Lin was obsessed with those hidden depths, her relentless curiosity propelling her toward groundbreaking discoveries. Today, July 16, 2004, promised a revelation, a glimpse into a world untouched by time. The locals whispered tales of underwater caves near Bazarudo Island, their descriptions tinged with a primal reverence. They claimed the caves harbored a relic of the past, the lair of a shark species believed extinct for millions of years. Maya wasn't one for superstitions, but the geological readings were undeniable. These caves could unlock secrets about the evolution of marine predators. The water shimmered as her team descended. Unlike the vibrant coral reefs surrounding Mozambique, this submerged world was bleak, the volcanic rock creating a labyrinth of shadows. Maya's heart pounded in her chest, a mix of exhilaration and the tickle of the unknown. They were pioneers here, explorers in the truest sense. The cave entrance was narrower than expected, barely large enough for a single diver to pass through. Maya gestured for her team to remain outside. This initial sweep was hers alone. Squeezing through the narrow opening, her powerful dive lights cut through the gloom. The cave walls were strangely smooth, the rock sculpted from eons of unseen currents. A thrill shot through her at the first sign of life. Fossilized remains embedded in the rock, remnants of creatures long dead. They were on the right track. This cave system was a treasure trove of natural history. Then a flicker of movement in the distance caught her eye. Her first thought was of a large fish disturbed by her presence. Yet as the creature turned, revealing its sleek profile, Maya's blood ran cold. It was a shark impossibly large for the confined space and bearing an archaic flattened head, unlike any species in her extensive database. The creature seemed just as surprised its eyes glinting in the artificial light. With a surge of both dread and joy, Maya knew the local legends were true. She was staring at a ghost from the prehistoric past, a creature that should not exist in these modern waters. The scientific implications were staggering, but her immediate problem was distinctly more visceral. How to escape a predator that had outlived the dinosaurs within the suffocating confines of an underwater cave? Maya's mind raced. Panic was a luxury she couldn't afford. Retreating wasn't an option. The narrow opening wouldn't allow her and the massive shark to pass. She had to find a way out, hoping against hope that her team was still positioned near the entrance. The shark, seemingly recovering from its initial surprise, started to circle. Its prehistoric eyes tracked her every movement, a calculating intelligence behind the primal instinct. Maya knew it was sizing her up, weighing the risk of attacking this strange creature that had invaded its domain. Suddenly the water exploded around her. The shark lunged, its massive jaws seeming to fill the entire passageway. Maya reacted instinctively, jamming her dive light into the creature's mouth. The shark thrashed, the light shattering, plunging them both into darkness. Pain lanced through her arm as teeth grazed her skin. She fought mindlessly, kicking and punching at the rough hide. The shark was disoriented, its ancient instincts ill-prepared for this resistance. With a final surge of desperate strength, Maya pushed away, scrambling back towards the entrance. The sudden light blinded her momentarily. Frantically, she signaled, her gestures frantic above the surface. Her team, alerted by the disturbance, reacted with the efficiency of countless drills. A lifeline appeared before her, a thick rope trailing into the depths. Grabbing it, she felt herself being hauled upwards. The world narrowed to the sliver of light above and the monstrous shape surging below her. Her ascent was agonizingly slow. The shark, enraged, snapped at her heels. She screamed, pain exploding in her leg as teeth tore through her wetsuit. Strong hands reached for her, pulling her roughly from the water and into the relative safety of the boat. She collapsed onto the deck, sobs racking her body. Blood swirled around her injured leg, but the worst of the damage seemed superficial. She was alive. Her team worked with swift precision. One bandaged her wounds, another radioed for backup. Their voices were a soothing hum against the roar of adrenaline in her ears. Below the surface, the prehistoric predator lingered, a sentinel at the mouth of the cave. It had claimed its territory, 
and the price of Maya's groundbreaking discovery was etched in her flesh. The media circus descended, hungry for sensational headlines and grainy footage of the unknown creature. Scientists demanded access, their excitement tinged with a hint of predatory ambition. Maya shut them all out, her mind a storm of conflicting emotions. She'd always believed in pursuing knowledge, but this felt different. The shark, a relic of a bygone era, had survived eons undisturbed. Did she have the right to expose its sanctuary to a world bent on exploitation under the guise of discovery? It took days of difficult conversations, a translator bridging the gap between her world of scientific jargon and their deep-rooted reverence for the natural order. In the end, a compromise was reached. Maya would publish her findings, meticulous data, and observations, but the cave's location would remain a secret. The scientific community would have to content themselves with the knowledge that somewhere, in the hidden depths of the Mozambique coast, an echo of the prehistoric world remained. Maya's injuries healed, but the encounter left a lasting mark. She returned to her expeditions, a newfound caution woven into her inherent boldness. The ocean still held endless mysteries, but she now understood that some secrets were better left undisturbed. The sea wasn't just Liam Taylor's job, it was in his blood. Saltwater ran thicker than ambition in his veins. He wasn't some adrenaline junkie seeking cheap thrills. It was the raw power of the sea that drew him, the constant, unpredictable dance between man and nature. Born and raised on the rugged Tasmanian coast, he'd fought riptides as a boy and wrestled fishing nets as a teenager. The U.S. Coast Guard had been a natural progression, and the Search and Rescue Division was his calling. Liam wasn't built for comfort. His wiry frame hid muscles honed by endless hours battling currents, not barbells. The relentless wind had weathered his face, carving lines around his eyes that spoke of countless battles won, and a few close calls he preferred not to dwell on. Some missions haunted him on sleepless nights, but those were the ones that fueled him, reminding him why he put on that uniform each morning. This stormy afternoon, November 12, 2009, was a reminder writ large. The distress call crackled over the chopper's radio, a garbled mix of panic and static barely cutting through the storm's howl. A group of reckless kids, no doubt high on hormones and a false sense of invincibility, had taken a battered dinghy out, miles past common sense and into the churning maw of the storm. Now they clung like terrified insects to a wave-battered rock the ocean playing with them before delivering the final crushing blow. Liam knew the drill. Suit up, check his gear twice, banter with his crew to mask the underlying tension. He'd danced this dance countless times. The ocean, his stage, desperate people, his audience, and him. The unlikely hero trying to cheat nature's ruthless game. The chopper descended, the world becoming a swirling mix of gray and angry blue. He'd faced sharks before, drawn by panicked thrashing and the scent of blood in the water. Most of the time it was tense but manageable. But out here in this storm-tossed wilderness surrounded by vulnerable prey, a knot of fear tightened in his gut. It was the fear he'd harness, turn into the razor-sharp focus that kept him alive. Below the teens were specks against the unforgiving rock, each breaking wave a death sentence waiting to happen. Time wasn't a luxury they had. It was his turn to step into the chaos and bring them back one by one. He promised himself with every mission, leave no one behind. Today that promise tasted like salt and steel, with a hint of something darker lurking just beneath the surface. Liam worked methodically. His voice was a lifeline for the terrified teens, a mix of calm commands and fierce encouragement cutting through the storm's roar. He clipped them into the harness one by one, giving them a brief reassuring nod before signaling for the winch. Each ascent brought hope, each empty return of the basket a twist of tension in his gut. Below the great white grew bolder. Its passes were closer now, its gaze fixed on the frantic activity above. Liam knew it was a matter of time. He was the interloper, the challenge to the predator's dominion. The teens were nearly transparent, just one more terrified boy clinging to the rock, his eyes wide with terror. He shouted out to the boy, but his approach spooked the shark. It surged upwards, a torpedo of muscle and teeth, its massive jaws stretched wide, a gaping maw from a nightmare. Time he seemed to freeze. Liam acted on instinct, shoving the teen roughly aside just as the shark struck. Pain exploded in his leg. The world turned red. 
He thrashed, the water erupting around him in a frenzy of foam and blood. The shark twisted, frustrated, its teeth still snagged on his wetsuit. Its prehistoric eye locked with his, cold and unyielding. Through the haze of shock and pain, his training kicked in. Don't panic. Signal. Fight back. He jabbed his rescue knife towards the shark's flank, desperately attempting to dislodge it. From above, he heard shouts, the whine of the winch reaching a frantic pitch. The shark released its grip with a sickening twist, retreating momentarily into the bloody depths. Strong hands were hauling him upwards, the pain secondary to the rush of icy air hitting his face. Breathless and disoriented, he clung to the basket, staring up at the faces of his crew, a blur of concern and grim determination against the swirling gray backdrop. On the chopper deck, it was controlled chaos. Rough hands cut away his wetsuit, revealing the ragged wound across his calf. Blood pumped in a sickening rhythm with his frantic heartbeat. A medic pressed a gauze to the wound, but it was futile. A desperate attempt to stem a crimson tide. Through the haze, he caught a glimpse of the last of the teens being pulled in. Shock etched on his young face. They were safe. In that blurry, pain-filled moment, the sacrifice felt worth it. The chopper changed course, cutting through the storm like an angry blade toward the promise of help. Yet he knew the journey was far from over. His vision tunneled, the world fading to the throb of his mangled leg, the distant chop of the rotor blades, and a sense of impending darkness. He'd faced the ocean's fury, the predator from the depths. It had taken a piece of him, a bloody toll, for his unwavering commitment to saving lives. The battle wasn't just against the elements or the relentless pain. As exhaustion washed over him, a tide more potent than the raging sea below, he knew the next fight would be on land. There would be surgeries, rehab frustration, and the prehistoric predator's lingering ghost lurking in his nightmares. The scars he carried would be both a burden and a badge of honor. It was the price of being a Coast Guard rescue swimmer, a price he'd willingly pay repeatedly because in those moments when lives hung by a thread, he was their only lifeline.